My name is Eric Froberg. I am the Director of Track Standards and Procedures at BNSF Railway. And I would also like to introduce Arthur Lima. He is a research engineer at the University of Illinois. And today we are going to be talking about the BNSF experience with resilient materials and track support. Just to give you some idea of BNSF Railway, we're a Berkshire Hathaway company. We've got approximately 32,500 route miles. So we operate in primarily the Western uh, two thirds of the US. Uh, we do have 32,000 uh, turnouts uh, that presents a opportunity, a challenge, and, and we'll be talking about that a little bit more here today. Since we are a Berkshire Hathaway company, I thought I would uh, open up with some quotes by uh, Warren Buffett. Um, I, I think they're very interesting and very uh, insightful. Uh, the first one is someone sitting in the shade today because someone planted a tree a long time ago. I think that's so true. We always build on what others have done uh, before us. So I think that's that's very uh, insightful. Uh, the next one is not necessary to do extraordinary things to get extraordinary results. And that's so true. The you know you think about all the low hanging fruit that's been picked and how much harder it is to uh, move the needle to make improvements. There's still a lot of, be, of gains to be made. They're they're just harder to get. And the last one, your premium brand had better been, be delivering something special or it's not going to get the business. And and that's really so true is, is that's that just says we need to be constantly improving our processes and what we do and making improvements. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things we're doing to reduce uh, track impacts today. Um, as we've seen over the years, this, this creates a lot of uh, maintenance for us uh, in the way of uh, slow orders, um, foul ballast, a lot of issues, uh, service interruptions. So we're constantly looking for ways to uh, reduce uh, track impacts. And innovation up to this point has been more of an iterative process with ideas coming from the, the field and being tested and rolled out. And we've taken now the, uh, the scope of, of teaming with our suppliers, uh, TTCI, University of Illinois, other academia, and our own research department to accomplish this. Um, big data is helping us move, uh, move the needle and, and uh, helping us make decisions uh, based on uh, real-time data and costs. Next slide is just, gives you some idea of all the different tools and, and measurements uh, that we have at our disposal here at BNSF. Uh, we've got reams and reams of data. Sometimes it's hard to go through it all, but we are using uh, technology to be a, a, a data-driven company in order to make uh, decisions and implement uh, improved track designs. Another item that, that's really taken off here in the last few years is our geometry card data. Um, we've gone from, you know, a lot of territories receiving, you know, maybe one run a year, one to two runs a year. Uh, up to now, we're getting runs, you know, as frequently as every 30 days. And, and uh, you know, you heard before we're around 32,000 miles of track, but we're getting 400,000 miles track miles per year with our, our geometry car fleet. So we're, we're getting all kinds of data and from which we can look at uh, trends and degradation models and really determine uh, where some of our issues out in track are. And I've just listed a few of the things that we're measuring with these cars, alignment cross level, curvature, track gauge, rail profile, uh, ground conditions and royal rail joint conditions. Yeah, with these uh, geometry cars, we do have some outfitted with Thor, which is our track health optical recognition. And we're able to pick up some incredible photos at track speed, that's at 70 MPH uh, freight speed. And uh, we've attached machine vision algorithms to automatically de detect the defects. And, and one thing this is doing, it's also highlighting uh, problem areas. You can see, you know, in a 
in a frog area here. We have some clips missing. It really highlights, you know, where do we need to be making improvements? I had mentioned tie padding, and that's really the focus of our presentation today is, is, is padding using uh, resilient materials in our transition areas to control some of the uh, deflections and impacts at those locations, which uh, have been giving us issue and is a, is a place that for improvement. Uh, with tie pads, we're basically able to spread the uh, surface area uh, of the load onto the tie. You can see on the left there, um, typically with a non-padded concrete tie, you get a very small bearing area. With tie, obviously, you get a little bit more, and then with padded ties, you've, you've really increased that ba uh, bearing area, and you're able to spread uh, the load and, and evenly distribute it as well. Um, along with these pads, we, we see a improved improvement with the ballast uh, breakdown, uh, mud, and pumping, and all the things that come with that. Basically provides an elastic interface. The next slide here is a, is, is a picture of a turnout and a, a tie diagram, essentially. And we've looked at, um, with the help of some of our suppliers, uh, have looked at how should we pad this, this turnout for optimal performance. And you can see basically a heat map on a, on a turnout, and, and the pads are laid out accordingly. Obviously, we try to minimize the number of individual pads used just for simplicity. Um, we do have some of these out in the field and, and we'll be continuing to talk about these here in the, in the uh, presentation. Uh, we have also used under tie pads to stabilize curves through, the through different temperature gradients. You can see here's a curve on the left out in Arizona. And uh, this was a curve that was walking on us essentially in the uh, through temperature gradients, uh, moving in and out. And, and we've used the pad pads to basically lock in the, the curve and they just haven't had the issues out there like they used to have. Um, below right is a, is a little picture there from the TTCI out in Pueblo. And you can see as the curve breeze um, you know, you do run into issues with uh, potential track buckles and things like that. Another place we've employed pads is, is with our insulated joints. And basically what we're doing there is we're, we're spreading out the load and we're able to control the overall deflection of the joint and prevent uh, epoxy breakdown and breakdown of the joint itself by uh, distributing that load and, and mitigating some of the overall impact. Bridges are another transition zone that we see issues with, and we've employed various configurations there. We have standardized on, on a ballast map where we do put concrete ties across our bridge. The bridge on the right there is, is in New Mexico over the Pecos River. And we've had uh, success with that. We are going to be looking at other configurations uh, with these bridges. Um, we do see issues at bridge ends, of course, in the transition area. Also looking for a homogeneous tie type for future maintenance on these bridges. A road crossing initiative is another place that we've seen with our geometry cars, uh, a need for improvement. Uh, typically, you're, you're coming off an area um, off a road crossing and, and you see dips off the end of the crossing and some of that is due to uh, drainage, the frequency of surfacing. So we're looking at um, trying to adjust that, that track modulus off the, off the ends of these crossings to control these dips and impacts and uh, reduce some of the maintenance challenges there. Uh, you can see some geo web at right. Uh, we're employing that on some locations to build a, a better foundation under some of these road crossings. Our diamond initiative, uh, we are working with TTCI and configuring uh, various, various pads, either uh, beneath the tie or above the tie or casting pads even to uh, reduce impacts and preserve the life of these diamonds. These are 
some of our highest uh, maintenance locations. And so, so we've got some sites uh, out throughout the U.S. that we're we're looking at, and we are trying to come down to you know what is the best configuration for for a diamond. Uh, we have also employed some expansion joints around our diamonds to help control um, a twist and and keep the, the the diamonds in line, which which helps extend the life. I'm going to turn it over now to. Arthur Lima with Railtech. Thank you, Eric. Uh, we're excited to be partnering with uh, BNSF on studying some effects of resilient materials on, on their track. And in particular, the motivation for this study that we're conducting is to investigate the effects of under tie pads on substructure stresses and special track work performance, as Eric mentioned. Uh, turnouts being uh, a, a very uh, problematic area and where there's a lot of interest in trying uh, new ways to modify or better manage the stiffness through it to reduce uh, maintenance and improve the life. So the objectives here were to understand the differences in life cycle cost associated with adding these resilient materials uh, by seeing if we can increase the asset service life and reduce maintenance costs associated with those areas and components. The three main, main, main parts of this study, part one, we're looking at uh, turnout improvement by using under tie pads to quantify uh, short and long-term benefits of using them in the current turnout designs. The second part is an open track bearing pressure study where we're trying to quantify the effects of different types of under tie pads under uh, crop concrete cross ties and seeing what their effect is on the substructure bearing pressures in a revenue service environment. And part three is laboratory experimentation. We've done uh, some experimentation already to under better understand how to use some of these methods. And we plan on continuing to use, to use laboratory experimentation as a way to supplement all of our, our field instrumentation efforts. So starting off with our turnout improvement study, our objective here, as mentioned, is to quantify the benefits of installing UTPs at these locations. We have a test site location on the Mendota subdivision where we have two uh, number 20 RBM crossovers installed. Uh, one is using a padding scheme and the other one has no pads, it's just a standard design. And we're monitoring a few different metrics to try to understand and quantify the difference in performance between those two locations. Uh, we're looking at vertical track deflections, in particular uh, the transient displacement amplitudes to see if, if the deflections at each one of those are different. We're looking at accelerations that are correlated to wheel impacts and vibrations on the, those areas. We're tracking absolute settlement to understand the rate of compaction and consolidation underneath each one of those turnouts and understanding if those pads are, are holding uh, everything in place a little better than than the non padded um, non padded design, and we're also monitoring track geometry. Um, again, similar to settlement, we want to track. You just use different geometry metrics to see if we can grasp some better understanding of the difference in performance between a padded and a non padded turnout. For the open track bearing pressure study, we are wanting to quantify the effects, as I mentioned, of different types of under tie pads on substructure bearing pressures. And for this study, we have a test location out on the VNSF Seligman sub on the Southern Transcon. And we're studying three different types of pads, or sorry, three different types of ties with two different types of pads. So we have a type one pad, type two, and a standard, which is our controlled non padded concrete cross tie. And we're monitoring at this side, we're monitoring vertical wheel loads, uh, input loads into the system. And we have pressure cells installed within the substructure to measure the pressures underneath each one of those uh, different types of ties. Uh, we also have a, a wheel counter to trigger all of our automated data collection system. So in general, this is what the, the field site layout looks like on, on the Seligman sub. We have two data collection sites, one of them uh, collecting data for one type of padded cross ties, and the second collected for both the standard and the 
a second type of padded cro concrete cross ties. Um, the, there's a separation between the two uh, types of pads with the standard ties of about 600 feet. So we could have somewhat of a transition between the two types of pads. And that's why the, the sites are separated the way they are. If we look at the bottom of this slide, we see the arrangement of those pressure cells with them being installed about 16 inches below the bottom of tie with, inside the sub ballast layer. And we currently have six uh, pressure cells installed at each uh, type of padded tie with three being installed underneath each one of the two ties that we have instrumented. So that way we get some, a larger number of, of locations to, to get a better understanding of what the, what the average pressures are underneath each one of those conditions. So with that, I'd like to thank you for, for your time listening to our presentation. I'll turn it back over to Eric for some concluding remarks. Thank you, Arthur. I appreciate your input here, and, and this is very exciting for us and BNSF to continue to progress with, with some of the studies we've done here. And ultimately, we're looking for, you know, really what is the, the cost uh, benefit? You know, what, what kind of benefit are we getting out of this and, and at what cost? And, and this really helps us uh, drive that and I know we have opportunities out there to make improvements and, and this goes um, um, to really doing that. It's, it's really hands-on out in the field and, and we're really getting some good, good results here. And, and thank you for your work on this, Arthur.